last left off talking about the inner workings of an atom, we were talking about scientists such as Thomson and Rutherford that had discovered the existence of subatomic particles. And if you recall, when we last spoke of them, we were just at the turn of the century between the 1800s and the 1900s. And this was really a revolution in our understanding of the universe, especially of matter, because up until Thomson and Rutherford, we thought atoms were indivisible. Now, in a very short amount of time, from about 1900 to 1940, our entire world is going to be flipped on its head. And the reason why it's going to be flipped on its head is because we're going to go through this massive exploration and understanding of what's happening within atoms, and it literally is going to blow our minds. So we're going to start by looking at this idea of modern atomic theory. We're going to refresh our memory with things that Rutherford and Thompson spoke into, and we're going to see how we evolve the concept of the atom from the simple model that Rutherford left us with that looks something like this, where we had the electrons spinning around a nucleus, to the modern day model of the atom that is known as a probability or electron cloud model. So, to refresh our memory. When we last spoke about Rutherford, if you recall, he was the one that came up with this idea of the nucleus, proved its existence, and said that in essence the electrons are spinning around the nucleus. Now, great idea, brilliant, you know, wonderful, huzzah, look at all the information we learned. But when scientists start to look at Rutherford, even Rutherford himself knows that there's a problem with this model. And the problem is that the nucleus, according to Rutherford, was ridiculously positively charged, right? Now, what we know today is we know that all of the, all of the uh, protons are stuck in the nucleus with the neutrons. And what Rutherford and other scientists, other physicists at the time, could look at is they would say, you know, an electron's negatively charged, this nucleus is ridiculously positively charged, if this is true, then what's going to happen is we're going to see over time the orbit of all electrons is going to degrade or fall into the middle. And if that's true, then that means that as we would look around, matter would constantly be collapsing kind of like this. Now, since last time I checked, matter just doesn't collapse in upon itself on its own, then probably what this means is that while Rutherford had some good ideas, there's something that he's missing. There's something that he's not aware of, or there's some science to an atom that we as scientists at the turn of the century were not clear about. So that's what we're going to be exploring as we move into this idea of modern atomic theory. Before I go further into subatomic particles, we need to do a little bit of a deviation, we're going to take a little bit of a tangent, and we need to take a moment to talk about energy. In particular, we want to talk about electromagnetic radiation. Because it's going to be this idea of electromagnetic radiation that we're going to marry with these subatomic particles, especially when we start talking about electrons. And if we don't understand what electromagnetic radiation is, it's going to get a little confusing. So bear with me while I go on a little tangent. So, at the turn of the century, it was believed that energy was wave-like in nature. That is absolutely correct. Why do I say energy is wave-like in nature? Well, one of the things that you should be aware of is that if you take a flashlight and you shine it into a dark room, you'll notice that even though the light has a primary brilliant spot somewhere on a wall, you'll notice that you can see that the, the sides of the room now suddenly are a bit more lit up. That's happening because light does not travel in straight lines. There is no such thing as a ray of light, as opposed to what you might have heard. Instead, what we would say is that a light travels as a wave, and what that means is that when light is traveling as a wave, waves can actually wrap or bend around a substance, right? They can wrap or bend around a wall, a window, etc., etc. So scientists know at the turn of the century that energy has wave-like properties. And this is important because when scientists would discuss and describe energy, they would use terms that they could not use when discussing something like matter. 
So oftentimes when we talk about energy, we'll talk about something known as lambda, which is known as the wavelength. And we'll also talk about the frequency. Okay, and so frequency, it's gonna look like this little Greek symbol here, kind of looks like a funky looking V, all right? And so this is frequency. And again, these are probably terms that you've heard before, wavelength and frequency. And we'll speak more about that in a moment. But we can't necessarily use something like wavelength to describe my textbook. I can't use something like frequency to talk about the frequency of the table that I'm at. That doesn't make any sense, right? Instead, when I talk about matter, I would usually use terms like it has a certain mass or so many grams, it has a certain hardness, it has a certain feel, right? Those are terms that I would use to describe matter. For energy, we would use a completely different set. Now, why was this critical and why was this important? Because scientists in studying the universe or natural world around us had started to realize that it seemed to fall into like two separate categories. We had matter on one hand, and on the other hand, we had our energy, right? Now, as long as we were talking about either matter or energy, then everything worked out well. So scientists start to study and see how does energy work? How does energy kind of uh, get transferred back and forth as we talked about in the prior unit when we were talking about heat energy moving back and forth. And in particular, the energy that scientists are studying is this idea known as electromagnetic radiation. Because back in the late 1800s, if you ask scientists, well, what is in outer space? They couldn't tell you with certainty that it was a vacuum. Right? They had a good idea, they had a hunch, but remember, we hadn't even flown yet at that point. So what would happen is that scientists had to kind of theorize and figure out how does, for example, light get from the sun to us here on Earth? How does heat get from the sun to us here on Earth? Right? How does light or energy travel through a quote-unquote vacuum? And the answer was electromagnetic radiation. Because electromagnetic radiation, as the name implies, is actually, is, it, it constitutes two separate waves that work together with one another. In electromagnetic radiation, as you see here in, again, my award-winning diagram, what we'll see is that we have a wave that is traveling, let's say, flat on the computer screen, that's my pink wave right here. And we see that this wave kind of goes up and then it's coming down and it's coming down over here and it's going back up over here, right? And so this is what we will, we will refer to as my electrical wave, okay? This is my electric wave. And then perpendicular to that, we have this yellow wave here and that's what these little arrows are designed to just demonstrate. And my yellow one is gonna be my magnetic wave. Okay, now this is terrible, so let me help you out. Let's just go to a better looking diagram. There we go. So when we look at electromagnetic radiation, there's a couple of things that we should notice. Number one, both of these are working in tandem with each other, meaning that they both complement one another. So if the wavelength, for example, if this wavelength here has a certain value, notice then that the wavelength in theory between this crest here and this crest here is going to be identical. So in other words, the wavelength is the same regardless if you are measuring the electrical wave or the magnetic wave. So that's the first thing you wanna look at. And then when it comes in terms of something like frequency, what we mean by frequency is how many waves do we see passing a point in a given amount of time? So frequency, if you listen to that statement again, how many waves do we see passing through a point in a given amount of time? Frequency is gonna have units of hertz. So frequency is measured in hertz. And a hertz is nothing more than like saying one per second. So in other words, we've been working with units a while, so let's make sure we're clear. When I say the frequency, it's how many things pass a given point per unit of time, right? So I could have, for example, I could measure what is the frequency of traffic, and I could count the number of cars that I see per unit of time. I could ask the question, what is the frequency of this wave, right? And I could count number of waves, crests that I see in a given amount of time. 
right? I could see what is the frequency with which I go to the bathroom. And again, I'm just measuring how often I make it to the bathroom, how much time passes in between. All of those are frequencies. And in each one of those cases, I'm measuring a thing, whether it's cars, whether it's waves, whether it's the number of times you go to the bathroom. And all of that is per, so above, a unit of time. The standard unit of time, like I said, is a hertz, so it's going to be one per second. Now, electromagnetic radiation does this really cool thing. Electromagnetic waves can actually travel in the absence of matter. And that's really important because it's really the only type of wave that can do that. For example, if I sit here and I do this, you heard sound waves. And you heard sound waves because what happened was that the particles of air, as I would clap my hands, it would move the particles of air, right? And then these particles would move the next set of particles, which would move the next set of particles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So sound waves are technically known as matter waves. This is why in a vacuum, let's say in space, you really can't hear anything. There's no such thing as sound in space because there's no matter to move around and then vibrate the little hairs inside of your ear. So most waves, like when I go to the beach and I'm seeing the waves come crashing in, those are matter waves. Those are particles of matter that are moving. Now, if I took that same beach wave, that water wave, and put it in a vacuum or put it out in space, guess what? We're not going to see it act as a wave. If I try to clap my hands out in space, I'm not going to hear any sound because there's no matter for those particles to move and vibrate and cause to push along. So when scientists were asked this question of, so how does heat and light, let's say from the sun, get to us? the answer came in the form of this idea of electromagnetic radiation. Because electromagnetic radiation can travel through a vacuum. It does not require a medium. Let me say it a different way. It doesn't require matter for it to travel through. So it doesn't have to travel through a rock or through water or through air, right? It can travel just in a vacuum. And so what happens is that as scientists studied this electromagnetic radiation more and more and more, they finally came up with a couple of very important concepts and relationships regarding our electromagnetic radiation. The first thing they said is that all electromagnetic radiation is going to travel at the speed of light. You may have seen this C before as in E equals MC squared. So C represents the speed of light. And the speed of light is actually a constant, at least in our universe. In a vacuum, the speed of light is going to travel at 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. This is the speed of light. Now again, just a couple of things to recap here. That is only in a vacuum. If you put light through, let's say, water, it slows down. If you put white light through the air, it will actually slow down. But in a vacuum, light will travel at the speed of light, which is approximately 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Again, don't get hung up on significant figures. We can get more analytical and precise. But for now, it just gives us a general idea. The other thing that scientists discovered is that if light travels at a constant speed, so if the speed's not changing, then there is a relationship that exists between the wavelength of the light and the frequency. So what we find is that the wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. What does that mean? That means if a wavelength gets longer, if the, the distance from one crest to another crest increases, in order to compensate, the frequency must decrease. In other words, if there's more space between each wave, then you're not going to see them as often. Conversely, if we take a wavelength and you shrink the size of said wavelength, then what we're going to find is that you're going to see the waves more often. So if wavelength goes down, we're actually going to see our frequency start to shoot up. Okay. Now, this is the relationship of how electromagnetic radiation works.
So we take it one step at a time, one ticket a talk, and you'll be there in virtually no time.